Hi everyone and welcome to the third in my series of three videos on common old age cat diseases. You can find my videos on kidney disease and hyperthyroidism on my channel, they're already up somewhere, maybe they'll be linked in the description below if I remember. And today we're going to talk about the third of the three most common old age cat diseases, which is actually a cluster of conditions, um, lymphoma and inflammatory bowel disease. I know that's more than one disease, but I'm going to lump them all together for reasons that are going to become obvious shortly. But before we get going, please remember to squish that subscribe button, pet the bell notification icon so you can see more of this little fuzzy cat butt, and of me of course. And uh, please share this video with everybody you know who owns a cat and your veterinarian because I think everybody will find this very, very helpful. Don't you think so, Mr. Pirate? Yes, he does. All right, let's hop down. Whoop. And let's get on with the educational portion of this program. What do you think, Mr. P? Should we talk about IBD? Before we get into this little cluster of diseases, uh, let's talk a little bit about terminology. So, old cats will often present with vomiting and weight loss. And one of the three most common reasons for this is this cluster of conditions. Now we have lymphoma, which is a type of cancer, and IBD, which is inflammatory bowel disease. Lymphoma, or more specifically alimentary lymphoma, so lymphoma of the stomach, intestines, and bowel, is the most common cancer in cats. And it actually breaks down to the two related but very distinct diseases. So you got your large cell lymphoma and small cell lymphoma. Inflammatory bowel disease also breaks down to probably like 20 or 30 different syndromes, but in the veterinary world, uh, we just kind of break them down into two categories, food responsive, which is functionally a food allergy that causes inflammation in the gut, and non-food responsive, which is inflammation in the gut that is not caused by a food allergy. The reason we talk about these four conditions, or four really groups of conditions, in one breath is because they all kind of look the same, and the diagnostic path to figuring out what's going on with them is the same. So they're kind of treated as one little cluster, and it is very, very common in cats as they age. I'm not going to try to make a comprehensive in-depth video on these conditions, because I mean, each one of them could probably be a 30 minute lecture on their own at the very least. But I do wanna give you guys an overview of how they present, how they're diagnosed, and how they're managed so that you're prepared to deal with it with your cat should they encounter this little cluster of syndromes. So let's start with presentation. All of these conditions present with cats who are losing weight, eating, maybe they eat okay, but they usually there's a lot of vomiting involved, so gastrointestinal signs, diarrhea, and again, we're talking about small bowel diarrhea, so watery diarrhea that smells incredibly bad, or sometimes even just incredibly foul-smelling poops. I know this is kind of a weird topic for discussion, but you, all of you cat owners know your cats will drop an atomic poo once in a while, and you know, the one that clears the house. So if your cat's doing atomic poos regularly, eh, it might be a good time to um, look in, to, to uh, take them to the vet, because the best case scenario, they have worms. Worst case scenario, they may have inflammatory bowel disease, because inflammation in the gut leads to very, very foul-smelling bowel movements. And then eventually the appetite decreases, so losing weight, not eating so well, chronic vomiting, most of the cats come in like that. If the owners are clued in and come bring them in early, they still look normal. And if the owners are not that clued in, or if it's like an outdoor cat that doesn't get a lot of observation, then often they'll come in with a lot of epaxial muscle loss. So that's wastage of muscle around the spine where the spine becomes quite bumpy and prominent. And the strips of muscle that lie either side of it seem kind of atrophied. So they look, they look bony from above. If you're petting them, you just kind of notice that they have a very bony back and pelvis. Uh, often their fur looks bad. They can get dandruff because of malabsorption in the gut of micronutrients that can definitely lead to some skin issues. And they just kind of generally look old and crabby and not so good. The first step in working up any old cat, of course, is blood work and urinalysis. And I'll never tire of saying that we should do blood work and urinalysis in any cat over the age of eight, at least once a year or maybe two every two years early on to catch these conditions. But what happens with these cats is we do blood work, we do urinalysis, and it looks pretty normal. So we can rule out our thyroid disease and our kidney disease right there. One thing that you should know that is not common knowledge among general veterinary professionals is that there is a blood test available to check for malabsorption in the different segments of the gastrointestinal tract. And this blood test is really useful if you're trying to decide whether uh, your cat really has a gastrointestinal issue or not, particularly when you do the basic screening blood work and it all looks normal. 
And this blood test is called the cobalamin and folate level. Cobalamin and folate are vitamins that get absorbed in different segments of the gastrointestinal tract. So you take a fasted cat, you do a blood sample on them, and you can measure the levels of these vitamins in her blood. And, dep- and if one of them is low, it actually tells you that, yes, there's inflammation in a segment of gastrointestinal tract, either the foregut or the hindgut, that is causing malabsorption. And that helps you both with localizing your ultrasound of the abdomen, localizing your biopsy site. It's a super useful test to do, but it's often only done by internal medicine specialists because it just doesn't seem to be well known in, by general practitioners. So, you know, if your family vet um, doesn't suggest a cobalamin folate and your cat has chronic gastrointestinal issues, you may want to ask them to look into it. Sometimes you, you don't have a low level of cobalamin of folate, but sometimes you can get actually increased folate, and that's often caused by dysbiosis. So abnormal bacterial populations in the gut, and that can actually be a sign of early IBD or mild IBD. So pirate's folate's always up because luckily he has fairly mild gastrointestinal signs, he doesn't have any malabsorption, but he does have inflammation in his gut from time to time, which messes with gut flora. So, So there is that to know about. The next step is abdominal imaging. Traditionally, people started with x-rays, although these days we really just do ultrasounds on these cats pretty early on. And this helps rule out structural problems in the gut. And when you get to the ultrasound is when things get interesting because on ultrasound is where you start being able to distinguish to some degree between the lymphomas and the inflammatory bowel disease, as well as getting some insight into what type of lymphoma and what type of inflammatory bowel disease you might be dealing with. Here's an overview of these four categories of disease. Large cell lymphoma is your classical cancer. There's a big mass somewhere in the bowels. Usually it's like a big lump you can easily see, often affecting just a single segment of gut where the rest of the gastrointestinal tract is pretty normal. You know, you can sample that, it comes back as cancer, large cell lymphoma. Small cell lymphoma presents as diffuse inflammation throughout the gut, often nearly impossible to distinguish from severe inflammatory bowel disease. And this is where a lot of overlap between lymphoma and IBD occurs because often on ultrasound, you can't tell the difference between them. Now, there are some ultrasonographic markers that might make one more likely, the other more likely, but you're never 100% sure. And then inflammatory bowel disease, again, presents without any big masses with segmental or isolated thickening of the bowel, but without the markers that make you worry about lymphoma. So you've done your blood work, you do some imaging, you end up doing an ultrasound, you either find a big mass that you can then go and biopsy and sample either and there's a bunch of ways of doing that. Maybe that's outside the scope of this video. Uh, but you either find a big mass or you find diffuse thickening in the bowels. And at that point, you can usually say either large cell lymphoma or inflammatory bowel disease, or you're in that gray zone in the middle where you're not sure if it's small cell lymphoma or just really severe IBD. Pirate is looking a little bit bored with all this. Look at this sleepy little cat. Wake up, Pirate. This is very important. Pirate's a great cat to be talking about this with because he actually has inflammatory bowel disease that I diagnosed like 10 years ago on him and he's been living quite well with it, but a little bit more about that later. So as you're progressing on your diagnostic journey, you may come to a point where the vet says, hey, your cat has either small cell lymphoma or IBD, we're not quite sure which, and at this point, we're gonna need to get a bowel biopsy. It's unfortunate, but it's just a fact of life that at some point, you will probably need to go in there, get a little piece of bowel, uh, surgically, of course, and then send it to a pathologist where they can mount it in a block of paraffin, cut it up into little slices, look at it under microscope with special dyes, and then tell you whether the cells in that thickened segment of intestine are cancer cells or just a normal infiltration of inflammatory cells, which gives you a diagnosis of IBD rather than lymphoma. And of course, other tumors can occur in the gut, but Uh, We're just talking about the most common one. Lymphoma is the most common one that happens there. Now, a little note here about surgical methodology. Um, It's often very hard to convince people to allow you to do a surgery on their cat, you know, for diagnostic reasons where that surgery involves, you know, unzipping their abdomen, reaching your hand in, pulling up some bowel and taking a little piece for biopsy. But luckily, uh, we have minimally invasive surgery options now in the 21st century. Unfortunately, of course, like maybe like 1% of veterinarians have access to this, but you know, I am a huge proponent of minimally invasive surgery and it's fantastic because people do tend to agree that, hey, if this procedure is going to 
help us save your cat's life and we can get a biopsy through a hole like this big, tiny little hole the size of a cat's ear um, through which we can find the bowel segment and take a little piece of it, tuck it away and the cat doesn't, they don't really know they had surgery done. It's like really minor procedure. Um, that tends to get much higher compliance. So it's really fantastic that we have these minimally invasive surgery options. And if you and your cat are dealing with this kind of syndrome and you come to a point where you've done the ultrasound and you just can't tell if it's cancer or severe inflammatory bowel disease and your vet says, well, we should really get a biopsy, please remember that you can ask your vet to find you a minimally invasive surgeon who can biopsy that bowel with very little trauma and very little risk to your cat and still get those full thickness bowel biopsies that are necessary for diagnosis. As a side note, some people do offer something called endoscopic biopsies where you put the cat under anesthetic and you can drive a little camera down their gut and you get little pinches of the uh, bowel from the inside. Uh, these are not full thickness biopsies and are not very good for diagnosing this kind of disease. In some cases, they're done just because it's the only vi you know, it's the only alternative to full surgery they have, but really endoscopy or endoscopic biopsies for inflammatory bowel disease are not very good and in my opinion are really not worth doing. You know, you can't reach the whole digestive tract through the mouth, only the front part of it. And the biopsies are just often non-diagnostic because when you do have cancer, it hangs out in like the outer layers of the bowel and the endoscopic biopsies can only sample the inner layers of the bowel. So really not worth doing. I really think you should get full thickness bowel biopsies and ideally with a laparoscopic approach or a minimally invasive approach. Although if you have to do a full surgical approach, so be it. Definitely a personal decision and a call you have to make with your family veterinarian. Let's say we went down this diagnostic journey and we ended up with a diagnosis of one of these four conditions. What do we do then? Well, let me give you a brief overview of these four groups of diseases so that at least you'll be armed with some degree of understanding when you go talk to your veterinarian about it. We'll start with a simple one. Large cell lymphoma, it's cancer. You deal with it as you do with any medically responsive cancer. So chemotherapy, I know it's a scary word and I will make a video about cancer treatment in cats in which I'll break that down and help you realize that cancer treatment of cats is not really that scary. It is nothing at all uh, like what you see on TV or what you deal with in human cancer management. And I'm just gonna, I always encourage my clients to just, whenever we have a diagnosis of cancer in a pet, just first of all, forget everything you've seen on TV or learned through personal experience with human cancer management because it's very different animals. But if you have a large cell lymphoma diagnosis, that's a cancer. It's responsive to medical management. You get great outcomes by veterinary terms um, in managing it. And it's something that can be done with the care of a veterinary oncologist or your family veterinarian if they're into oncology. All you really need to know about that is that once you have that diagnosis, then you move on to oncology services and then they can help your cat maximize their quality of life and hopefully extend it as well and manage the disease. And again, that's just a whole different set of discussions that maybe we'll have one day on this channel. Now, if you have a small cell lymphoma diagnosis, things get a little more interesting. Small cell lymphoma, while it is a true cancer, is a very slow progressive one and responds really well to conservative management. So cats with small cell lymphoma will often live for many, many years just getting a pill every day or every other day. So the treatment for small cell lymphoma is very different from treatment for large cell lymphoma and it really doesn't resemble classical cancer management very much at all. Generally speaking, a pretty good diagnosis, particularly if you make it in like a 16 or 17 year old cat. So small cell lymphoma is one of those diagnoses that I actually like to get for my patients because I know that these guys are generally speaking gonna do pretty well long term. Obviously there's always potential for complications, but yeah, that one's not too bad. And I always, I'm always happy for the patients who have this rather than the other version. And yeah, I always encourage people not to panic because that's quite manageable. Just be you see, you're gonna be giving your cat pills and they're gonna be like one pill a day or one pill every other day and your cat's gonna do pretty well. Now let's talk about the inflammatory bowel disease side of the equation. Inflammatory bowel disease is just a really broad term. It's analogous to like IBS in humans. It's a multitude of syndromes, different cell types involved, different bowel segments involved. Some of these patients have really mild symptoms and they require minimal medical management. Others can be incredibly sick and in fact look like they have cancer. And we think that some forms of inflammatory bowel disease actually transform into cancer later in life. So it's really worth managing and important to monitor properly because you can have inflammatory bowel disease that transforms into something like small cell lymphoma or even large cell lymphoma at least that's, what we, that's the way we think about it. In reality, chances are 
those cases that have an inflammatory bowel disease diagnosis and then turn to lymphoma later, many of those might just be a lymphoma that got misdiagnosed. It is definitely, there's definitely some gray areas there that are a bit hard to tell, but the main message here is that it's a complicated, complicated group of diseases, some severe, some not but we try to break it down into food responsive and non-food responsive. Now we know that in dogs, um, in whom inflammatory bowel disease is incredibly common, uh, roughly 50% of dogs with IBD have a food responsive version, which is functionally an allergy to a protein. In cats, I don't know what the percentages are, and I've never seen studies on that, but certainly it's probably close to that as well. So probably about half have food responsive, which can be managed with diet alone, and about half have non-food responsive, in which diet just doesn't work and you have to give a medication every day. And at that point, it looks very similar to small cell lymphoma management where you just give your cat a pill every day or every other day or maybe every third day and they're functionally normal as long as they get that medication. Let's break this down a little bit further. Food responsive IBD is an allergy to a protein in the food. And it doesn't matter what the quality of the protein is or the type of the protein is. You, you hear these kind of terms thrown around like high quality protein, blah, blah, blah. None of that matters. It's just a protein that your body should digest normally and it has an inappropriate inflammatory response to it. And if that inappropriate inflammatory response is in the gut, you get inflammatory bowel disease. You develop this inflammatory response to a protein your body has seen before if you're just unlucky to be predisposed to this. Again, nothing to do with the quality of the protein. I mean, chicken is often the thing that animals end up allergic to, but it's only because chicken is a common ingredient, not because there's anything particularly bad about chicken. So don't get into that line of thought. And the way we diagnosed in food responsive inflammatory bowel disease, and this is a very important point, is there's no lab tests for it. Some people try to sell you lab tests. There are labs out there that offer them. They're not accurate. Those are, you know, as of the making of this video, they are scams. The only way to diagnose food responsive inflammatory bowel disease, so the only way to diagnose food hypersensitivity or protein allergies in your pet is to do a food exclusion trial. And that involves feeding them a protein that their body has never seen before for a minimum of six to eight weeks. You manage all the secondary symptoms in the first few weeks of that. So you put them on this food that is a protein their body has never seen before and therefore cannot possibly be allergic to, and you see how they do. If all of their symptoms resolve over those six to eight weeks, then they probably have a food responsive form of IBD. And we have a number of diets as veterinarians that we can use for these kind of food exclusion trials. There are new protein diets using things like alligator or rabbit or venison or kangaroo meat, which are just not common meats used in pet food. There are also hydrolyzed protein diets where the protein's been heat treated to break down the tertiary structure so the body doesn't recognize it as such. It's really a vet's choice which one they use. They all work, more or less. I would say they will work 95% of the time. This is why usually if a pet fails a food exclusion trial, meaning that there's no improvement with six to eight weeks of food exclusion, I usually do a second one just to be sure because some pets will respond to one and not the other. We're just a different food. And I, I feel like I can make a whole video just on food exclusion trials. So, you know, keep an eye out for that. I'll make that one day. But if you do that and your pet just gets better with a diet change, fantastic. Food responsive IBD can be managed for life with just different food. Um, you know, they may develop allergy to the new food eventually, and then you just switch it again. And it's, it can certainly convert to non-food responsive IBD later in life, but usually it doesn't. So it's, no, it's not like a terrible problem to have. Now, you can do food challenges at the end of a food exclusion trial where you give them a little bit of like, a little bit of chicken, a little bit of beef, a little bit of lamb for just a day or two. And if they're allergic to it, you'll, you'll see them react, like they'll vomit or have diarrhea or whatever their symptoms were beforehand. But most people just don't bother. Most people, you just switch them to a hypoallergenic diet, cat does great. People don't really care what exactly protein they were allergic to. They're just happy to their cat that looks normal and they just stay on that food for as long as practical. So that's how you manage food responsive IBD. Now, if you do a food exclusion trial and there's no improvement and you do a second one, still no improvement and you know, just your patient's not doing great, then hey, they probably have a non-food responsive IBD. Not the end of the world, but definitely a little bit more hassle to manage. We manage non-food responsive IBD with medication, and traditionally people have used corticosteroids for this, so prednisolone. This is a go-to drug in so many vets' hands, and a lot of cats end up on prednisolone for a long time, and sometimes for months to years. And, you know, it is a tool that works, but it has so many issues. You know, it makes cats fat, it leads to muscle atrophy, it can lead to heart failure, diabetes. It is just a very, very, 
double-edged sword, let's put it that way. Luckily, we have an alternative to prednisolone called budenicide, which unfortunately a lot of vets don't know about. But budenicide is a corticosteroid that has very poor systemic absorption. So it works just like prednisolone in the gut, but it has minimal side effects systemically. It'll still have some, you know, it's not a perfect drug, but it is way better than pernicillone. So if your vet ever prescribes pernicillone for your cat, for gastrointestinal issues specifically, always ask them, hey, have you heard of budenicide? And if not, can you look it up, please? Get yourself educated. And there are some cases, like for example, if you have concurrent liver disease where pernicillone may be preferable, but for straight up inflammatory bowel disease that doesn't respond to food exclusion trials, budenicide is absolutely my drug of choice. And you can use like, I think the dosages I use are like a quarter of a milligram once a day. I get it compounded into little capsules or paste. So it's like I get compounded for each patient for the, based on their body weight. And then you could just like give them a pill once a day. They respond great and you avoid a lot of the nasty side effects of prednisolone. So I cannot possibly recommend budenicide strongly enough. And again, because it's not a medication that's very well known in our profession, it is something you need to hassle your veterinarian to look into. So a lot of general practitioner vets aren't really familiar with it. Mm -mm -mm. Oh, Pirate had to go off and check his fan mail. Just he'll be back in a moment. But I just wanted to mention that I've went over the specific treatments for this cluster of conditions that we're talking about. But there's also some non-specific supportive care stuff you can do. Things like probiotics, um, you know, making sure your cats have are well hydrated with good access to water at all times, vitamins. So any patient that has absorption issues in their gut will often be vitamin deficient, specifically B vitamin deficient. So it is recommended to supplement these cats, whether they have lymphoma of any type or any kind of inflammatory bowel disease in their gut with B vitamins. And there's, you know, you can get veterinary B vitamin supplements. You just squirt a little bit on their food every day and that corrects for that. Uh, we also give B vitamins in IV fluids often when these guys come to the hospital, if they're really dehydrated, haven't eaten for a while, um, you might want to give them IV fluids. And again, you can give them vitamins IV, you can give them anti-nausea medication and appetite stimulants to help them get past that initial, you know, lack of appetite, that initial anorexia, that initial nausea, while we're trying to figure out what the disease is and how to best manage it. But ideally our goal is to stabilize these guys to a point where they are getting like the minimal man management or the minimal amount of medication needed to basically be a normal, happy, healthy cat. And I think that's a very achievable goal. All right, Pirate, you coming back? So Mr. Pirate, now let's take, talk about Mr. Pirate's story. This little guy developed inflammatory bowel disease when he was like 10 years old. And I had him on budenicide uh, probably for about five or six years. And I tried a variety of food exclusion trials with him. And eventually I found one that worked. So I was actually able to take him off of budenicide after several years. And now he's very well controlled with diet alone. Uh, you know, he still gets the occasional like atomic poo <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking about. Um, but you know, aside from like maybe a vomit or a little bit of diarrhea like once a month, he does really well. And you know, that's a very, very good outcome for an IBD cat. And you know, he, oh, people always say how fantastic Pirate looks for his age. He's like, what, I think 17, 18 years old now. And look how fat and happy he looks. He would not look like this if he had uncontrolled IBD. In fact, he'd probably be dead by now. So. Absolutely, like treating this is so, so worth it and so important because these cats will live a normal and happy life, um, whereas they would not if this condition was ignored. So Pirates really is a poster child for effective inflammatory bowel disease management. Like his life and my life with him has been so much better because we figured it out. And, you know, sure, he has to eat this gross <laughs> hydrolyzed diet, but yeah, you know, it's a small price to pay for a lifetime of health. So now you guys have a pretty decent understanding of what gastrointestinal lymphoma and inflammatory bowel disease in cats looks like and what it means. And hopefully this will give you the understanding to make informed, rational decisions about your cat's welfare as they age. Thank you very much for watching. Please remember, again, to like, subscribe, share this around, give your cat some love, and I'll see you guys next time.